If you'd like to hear about how this former Olympic athlete, high-level personal trainer, nutrition coach, and business owner went from meathead to plant-based after receiving a potential cancer diagnosis, then this episode of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show is for you. Welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show, where each week you'll hear the real-world experiences, life lessons, and guided principles that every highly driven man needs to master, their health, productivity, and relationships by sharing conversations with the world's most successful people in fitness, nutrition, supplementation, and mindset. Meet your host, Benjamin Brown. He is a fitness and nutrition expert, consultant to Fortune 500 companies and world championship sports teams, a husband and father of three, and has been helping men transform their physiques, optimize their energy, and own their fatherly mission since 2005. Thank you for joining us today, and without further ado, let's jump right in. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to episode number 70 of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show. Today on the show, I am honored to bring on my friend Matt Terry. Matt is the co-owner of Body Solutions, a personal training studio in Overland Park, Kansas. Matt's a personal trainer, nutrition coach, and all-around nerd for anything exercise-related. Matt holds a degree in exercise science from MSSU, eats plants, lifts heavy things, and coaches people to be their best self. Um, this was a really fun interview for me and, and just a great conversation that Matt and I have as he takes us through his basically life journey from overweight child and teen to Olympic uh, powerlifting athlete to football player to natural bodybuilder and the myriad of nutritional regimens that he undertakes along the way what worked for him, what didn't, why he made the life-altering decision to go plant-based after a potential cancer diagnosis in 2015, and not only why the plant-based has been so revolutionary for him, but also how the diagnosis itself forced him to kind of reframe everything in his life and reprioritize and focus on the things that really matter. So this is a great conversation with a lot of clinical pearls from a nutrition standpoint um, and health standpoint. We talk about fasting. We talk about time-restricted feeding. We talk a little bit about supplementation and physiology, but really in bigger picture, it's about you know focusing on the things that matter in our life. So I know you're going to enjoy listening in. Uh, with that said, if you do, assuming you do, please do me a huge favor and leave a positive rating and review in iTunes so that I can get this message out to more people across the world on how to make smart nutrition simple. Appreciate you so much. Thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the show. Matt Terry, welcome to the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show. What's up, brother? Nothing, man. Thanks for having me on. Awesome to be here. Absolutely. I'm super happy to have you here. I think you've got a really incredible story and mission to be able to share with our listeners. And so I'm just excited. I haven't seen you. I mean, obviously we're, we're just doing this via video, but I haven't seen you. And I don't know, when was the last time? Like 2012, maybe? At a, yeah. Yeah. Probably the last biosig. Yeah. Probably the last biosig in Scottsdale. And you, uh, you were a little bit heavier then. Yeah, I was about, I was about 50 <laughs> pounds heavier. <laughs> so yeah. what's, what's been going on since, since then? Uh, why don't you uh, enlighten our listeners a little bit about who you are and kind of sure. what your journeys look like? So my background, um, I mean, I think like everyone, you need to get into fitness for one reason or another. Obviously, it's to help people. But I think for me, I was, I was like more of the obese, a majority of the first part of my life and most of my family is. So for me, uh, I just got tired. I just got a bit sick and tired of being fat and you know tired and so for me it was just constantly like this never ending journey just be better and then even though i was really away i was actually a really good athlete so mm -hmm. for me it kind of it became a good positive tailspin of okay well as i lift weights and as i get in better shape obviously i lose weight but that makes me better at sports and oh by the way it increases my self-confidence and now people stop picking on me so it became like a really good positive momentum and then once I finally lost the weight and found out what worked for me, I mean, that just became my passion of like helping other people, especially people who are struggling with both eating disorders and disordered eating, which I've had both. Um, and then just overcoming a lot of, um, a lot of the mindset issues that people have with just food and hangups with food and just a lot of that piece and you know, a lot of what precision nutrition teaches and those type of yeah. things. Um, how, and just using those skill sets. It, let's, can we take a step back real quick? So yeah. how did you lose the weight initially? 
Sure. So when I was younger, uh, I, what actually is funny, and it's not a plug towards our industry, my parents got me a trainer. Sure. So we're from a very small town, about 4,000 people. And I was a very good football player. I was, I was All-State uh, first team my junior and senior year. I was honorable mention All-American. I played college football. I was very good. What position? I was really overweight. Uh, when I was in high school, I was actually a lineman, which is kind of yeah. funny. And then I was in college. Makes, was sense if you, makes sense if you were a bigger guy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in high school, legitimately, I mean, I could squat 600 pounds. And I could bench 400 pounds, weighing about 195. Yeah. So I definitely was genetically gifted towards strength training. I mean, so a lot of my a lot of my gains, even though I worked my ass off, a lot of it did come pretty easy. I was very fortunate on that. Um, but how I lost it is I got a trainer, and he taught me about nutrition. He taught me about exercise. I started working out with him. I, I actually started in powerlifting is where I actually started competing. And then I, I actually ended up competing in every sport, and I was – uh, an elite Olympic, uh, we lived for the U S for several years. I lived with Olympic training in college Springs, won several national championships. And that all just kind of just kept propelling my interest in fitness. And then now I just do natural bodybuilding shows and, and obviously train and nutrition coach and work with people in person online. But how I initially lost my weight was with that trainer. And that's just kind of really, that's when I realized I was like probably 12 or 13. And that's when I realized like, this is what I want to do. I want to help people. I want to be able to change someone's body because I was always kind of a control freak. Probably goes with my OCD. Yeah. And I think that once I learned, like, wow, you you actually can change. Like, I'm not destined to be overweight. I'm not destined to, you know, have low confidence and suffer and be embarrassed with my shirt off. Like, these are things that I can actually change. Like, I just thought at first it was just my genetics because everyone in my family is overweight. I thought that well, this is the cards I'm dealt. I'm just going to be fat and happy. And and then I realized, no, you can change. And it's not that hard. You just need the correct guidance, the right plan, the right support. And that's really what got me into fitness and keeps me in it. I mean, naturally with powerlifting, you're going to be, you're going to be holding on to, you know, probably more body fat than mm -hmm. average athlete. It, it serves you well. So how did you make the transition? Like kind of when your Olympic lifting career was over, mm -hmm. how did you start to make the transition into kind of, or, or, or did you... Or did sure. it take you a while in terms of the kind of what your ideal weight or, or body composition, you know, what you wanted that to be? Well, I think it's funny because I'm only five, six and I've always carried my weight really well. I've always been extremely vascular, you know, in my arms and legs. And even though when I was heavier, I still carried it really well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at one point in time, my dad was 400 pounds. And he's about six, one. So he's a big dude. And he always carried it very well. He wasn't sloppy. He looked more like a like almost like a defensive lineman in the NFL, sure. just big everywhere. Right. You know, so I was fortunate that my grandfather on my mom's side was an absolute ogre. So I've always carried it actually really well. And so I kind of did it backwards. So I did football in high school. Then I went the Olympic route because I had a short window there. And then I actually retired when I was 21. Then I played football in college. So my weight class was 94 kilos. So I generally competed around 207 to 210. And I was at the time the shortest light heavyweight in the world. And I was just outgrowing my weight class and I just couldn't stay there anymore. And I was constantly getting injured. I had just mass, I had back surgery, knee surgery, I had tons of wrist and shoulder problems. And mm -hmm. at 21, when you can't tie your shoes, cause everything hurts so bad. Yeah. I just, I was like, you know, I'm done. And after quarter zone shots, after quarter zone shot in my hip, it just, I was like, I think I just, I'm done at this point. So then I, I started playing college football and then I went from 200 up to 230 because again, when you're five, six and you're playing high level college football, you better be pretty heavy because I'm not tall. So once I was done with that, I dropped all the way down to 190 and I, and I stayed there for several years and started uh, doing bodybuilding and then just kind of got back into powerlifting a little bit and got back up to 220. And then I just realized you know, I just wasn't happy and yeah. I, didn't, I didn't like it. And then I kind of got down to some rabbit holes, which we all get into about like the uber low carb thing and just massively high protein diets. And, and that just made me fat. And I got really overweight at that point. And that's actually about when we met at Biosig because I was about 225 at that time. And I was just like looking for a magic bullet, honestly. That's why I was at Biosig because I was like, right. this is my fault. I'm right. doing everything right, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then um, I decided I always want to do a bodybuilding show. So I hired a coach and taught me carbs aren't the enemy. And just I trained for eight months and I lost 50 more pounds. And I got down to about 165 actually was the day I competed for the show. And I took third in Mr. Kansas. And and I've stayed, I'm, today I'm about 184. So I like to stay around that 180, 185. That's what feels comfortable for me. And that's actually, but well, it was about four years ago. And that's really what has taught me just weight maintenance and found what works for me. And I can now maintain my weight pretty easily. And, and that's kind of where I'm at. And, and it was really just some kind of logical calorie control, like nothing, 
you know, crazy. You ate protein, carbs, and fats. You know, you trained your ass off, but you did it consistently mm-hmm. day in and day out, even with a busy schedule with mm-hmm. training clients for 10 plus hours a day, you know, um, all of those types of things. Absolutely. There was, it was really funny because there was no magic bullet. Because I remember when we first started, I was like very low carb and slowly started bringing. And at one point in time, he got my carbs all up to 500 grams a day. Nice. Oh. I was like, oh my God. I mean, now when I was competing Olympic lifting, because I was, I have my undergrad was in dietetics and then I also have a degree in nutrition or exercise science. So at that time I was used to tracking every day just for part of the degree structure. But mm-hmm. I was also at that time a very high carb athlete and I never had weight problems and I always felt great. And it wasn't really till I had problems with weight and feeling like crap until I went ultra low carb. And, and then when, so when he started bringing me out of that and increasing carbohydrates, man, like, and originally I was working with Jim Vival as a client. Oh, got, right on. Yeah. He, so he kind of initially got me out of it and fixed all my adrenal insufficiencies and my low thyroid and just all these problems. I just drew myself from the ground. So, but so you think when you cut out, you were just kind of searching um, for something. And so you figured you'd listen to the gurus and, and, and go down the road of carbs are the enemy. And it, it just puts you in a, it, in a hole physiologically. Exactly. Exactly. So what, what ended up happening is I got, like everybody, I got down some deep rabbit holes. So initially I saw some, which we now know, which is calorie reduction. I saw some initial success with low carb because I reduced my calories, right? And you lose some water weight and, and I started feeling a little bit better. Um, and then, but at this time I wasn't tracking my intake. I was just eating tons of protein. And then obviously Charles recommended, well, you should be eating two to three grams of protein a day. So at one point in time I was literally eating 450 grams. Of protein. Two to three grams. Oh. That's right, dude. That's that's so funny. Uh, I was just thinking about that the other day because there was a period where he was saying, you know, if you, yeah, if you're insulin resistant, yeah. you should be eating two grams of protein per yep. pound of body weight. Exactly. And, and there's more, some more contextual stuff around it, but really it's like, dude, two grams. I mean, it's just so, oh, it's dude. so much when you really sure. think about it for the average person. And uh, yeah, so you were actually doing that though. <laughs> and it's, yeah, exactly. And especially when you're coming from like, like a, a generally like a no protein powder approach. I mean, dude, I was eating like five. Oh, fucking that's of like I can't. I can't imagine. I can't imagine doing crazy. that without protein powder. It was crazy. I mean, it was literally five or six meals a day, and each meal is about a pound of meat because that's about fifty to sixty oh, grams of protein depending that's on the gross, source. Man. So I mean, just yeah. And so then I get with a Val, and he's like, "Dude, what the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> and so he started putting me on you can, and slowly brought up my carbs mm. a little bit, like you know. Carbs not the enemy for insulin resistance, dude. He's like, you've made yourself insulin resistant. Now I understand the mechanism behind it, which I absolutely did. And he just slowly, slowly bring up my carbs and I slowly drop my protein, slowly drop my fat. And then when I started working with my coach, I just started tracking my intake. I tracked my intake every day for 474 days on my fitness pal. It was really easy. I just slowly made calorie reductions every week to the show and I reversed diet out of it. And it was fine. It wasn't anything magical. And, you know, I ate good, clean carbs and healthy food, but I mean, now I can eat, I, there's some days I'll hit 700 grams of carbs a day and I have zero blood sugar problems. My A1A1C last time I checked was 4.8. Um, my fasting glucose is typically 80, 81. I mean, all my labs are always great. Um, I have great energy. I don't use caffeine at all anymore um, because, you know, you start listening to these gurus and you get down these rabbit holes. I'm like, okay, so carbs are the enemy. Insulin is the, is the enemy. So I don't ever want to spike insulin. Even we now know whenever using dairy and, and, and protein, your insulin is always elevated anyway. Right. Um, and then then I'm like, well, now my energy sucks. Now I'm pounding caffeine. Oh, well, it must be because my eating windows are too long. So now I need intermittent fast. Now I'm fasting till noon and eating till six. You know, and you're training like 12 to 14 clients a day, trying to work out. You're getting up at four. I very quickly drove myself into a, just a, a complete rut. And then I go get my hormones done. My TSH is like almost five. I mean, like everything is destroyed. My testosterone went from 800 down to 220. I mean, my free testosterone at one point, my free testosterone at one point was six. Oh. And I was just like, what is going wow. on? Wow. So I just felt worse and worse and worse and worse. And so that's once, honestly, once I did the bodybuilding show and just the coach has been like, no, man, like you don't, you don't need, you just need this. Once I did that, it was like, was it magical? I tracked my intake. I stayed consistent. I worked out. The weight fell off. I've kept it off and it's pretty easy. So you obviously figured out a, you know, figured out your own nutrition, but also through along the way, figured out that there's no right way. And you figured out that it's just, it's just about consistency and control and tracking um, and making good decisions consistently, you know, in terms of protein, carbs, and fats. And, and I'm assuming that's what you implement with your clients, but 
then you kind of had a bit of a roadblock um, over the last couple of years. Would you mind talking about that? Yeah. So after my bodybuilding show, when I lost all that weight, I really, I was still kind of in the mindset, well, like, well, I want to put this weight back on. And I was still in the mindset that carbs made you fat. So I'm like, well, I don't want to use carbs because I don't want to get fat. So I was like, let's do a keto diet. You mm -hmm. know? I always have clients ask me about it. I've never really done it. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. So I did it for 16 weeks um, before disaster struck. The first seven weeks, honestly, I felt great. I mean, I, I had good energy. Um, my training was good. But I now that I know the warning signs of what was happening, I, I mean, I stopped sweating when I worked out completely. I was waking up several times at night to pee. I mean, so these are all signs, obviously, of low thyroid response, increased um, – you know, sympathetic response. So just my system is tanking at this point. Yep. Um, and I started noticing when I was working out, I was wearing sweats because I was getting cold and I still wasn't sweating. I'm like, this is kind of weird. Um, and it wasn't winter. So I was like, this is weird. And so I just didn't pay attention. Then I started getting really nauseated on keto. And I started getting super bloated. And then I started getting massive gallbladder pain mm. all the time. And I'm were like, you, were you intermittent on? fasting with Keto? Not at that time. No, okay. not at that time. I was just doing straight keto. And I did it and everyone's like, oh, you, you know, you've got to do it right. Dude, I did it to the letter. I, I believe and a, and a majority of my fat because coconut oil can't be stored as fat, which is total horseshit. Um, and it's going to be instantly metabolized like glucose and it doesn't get, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I'm using tons, predominantly like most of my, and I did clean keto. I'm not, I wasn't doing like the bacon and cheese keto. Like I was doing like very low glycemic, low carb vegetables, you know, with lots of fiber. I was using a fiber supplement. Uh, my protein intake was was organic, cleaner meats, even though they were higher fat. I did not use a lot of dairy. My main fat source was coconut oil. But I really felt like all I was doing was eating coconut oil, drinking MCT oil, occasionally eating a very small amount of meat That's and gross. green vegetables. And yeah. I was like, look, who the hell can sustain this? Number one, it's one of the most unappetizing diets ever. And, but dude, I was also taking keto force, which is the, you know, exogenous BOHB supplements. I was measuring my blood ketones every day and I never got out above 1.0 ever hmm. on BOHB. And so I was like, what is the deal? I can't even get ketosis. Then I started noticing my blood sugar climb and I've never been diabetic, but at the time my blood sugar started showing. I was like 119, 121. I'm like, what is going on? Oh, it's high. I go, so I happened to get a life insurance exam at that time because I was upping my life insurance. I come back, my blood pressure is like 150 over 110. I was like, whoa, that's never been elevated in my life. Um, my kidney function was starting to decline. Um, my liver enzymes were through the roof. ALT and AST were both over 70. Um, I was like, what is going on? My cholesterol went from 150 to about 325. Wow. And I mean, I was showing massive markers of inflammation across the board. I was like, what is the, my CRP, which is usually 0.1, was right. at which is, is still not high, but when you're at 0.1, to go from 0.1 to 1, there is a problem, okay? And now that I know, obviously, a little bit more research, and I've actually had my genetics run, um, I, the worst thing I could have done to myself. So as about week seven, week eight, I start feeling really nauseated. Then I start getting a lot of GI distress. Wait, it, that, every, it, it, regarding the genetics, do you have the yeah. APOE4? Yeah, I do. I have three and four. Okay. Yeah, so I'm three, I'm three four. That makes sense. Um, and, and just to, to be clear, and I don't know a lot about this, this stuff, but the APOE4 uh, genetic uh, SNP is, is highly correlated to, well, basically you want to keep fat relatively low for yeah. longevity purposes because yeah. it's, it's well, correlated to- um, Exactly. Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, right. And what's even funnier about that, Ben, so when I pull my report, I'm like, holy shit, I, think, I don't think I could have done- any other, if I wanted to screw myself up, it's probably the worst any, possible thing. Yeah. It's probably the worst thing I could have done. So I had the um, uh, PMT gene, which is correlated to poor liver and gallbladder function and, and fatty <laughs> liver. So I have that. I'm homozygous for that. So it even says in my report, I should never do a high fat diet. And if I do, it shouldn't be above 30%. And my fat should be coming from primarily mono and polyunsaturated fats. I was all saturated fat. You know, so I, and so then it also, I correspond to like all the high saturated fat intakes for markers of diabetes, um, cholesterol, hypertension, literally everything you could go wrong. Like I was doing everything that my generic report said I shouldn't do, which intuitively at that time, I was like, in my entire life, I have never felt good on a high fat diet. Now I know why my gallbladder sucks genetically, yeah. you know? And so I had all these other issues going on and, 
And so that's when I started seeing my blood sugar climb. And I'm like, I'm not even eating carbs. How the hell is my blood sugar so high? And so all this is kind of coming. And I just didn't understand at the time, which now I do. And I had all these other issues in terms of like digestive distress and energy and just constant yeah. weakness and nausea. And I was like, what is it. going on? So no uh, long story short, the day before my birthday, when I turned 36, my appendix ruptures, it explodes in my stomach. Oh. So I'm sitting here talking to a client doing a nutrition consult. And it felt like someone, like a horse kicked me in the gut. I was just, I remember I just kind of bent over. I was like, Oh, and she was like, what's wrong? I'm like, I don't know. It's like the worst stomach ache I've ever had. And so I go to urgent care. And so they do, uh, you know, plain film x-ray. And they're like, well, your colon's completely blocked. So you're probably still constipated. I'm like, this is not constipation. Like this is some of the worst pain I've ever had. So they gave me like a smooth muscle relaxant. And so, but they palpated where my appendix should be, which it's not there anymore because it's exploded. So I'm like, man, she's like palpating above my right hip. I'm like, no, there's no pain there. I feel fine. And so she's palpating up around. I'm like, you know, that's kind of sensitive, but I'm like, that's my goal better. And she's like, yeah, well, okay, whatever. And I'm like, whatever. Well, now I'm putting the two, two together. So at that time, my stools were literally white and I didn't understand. Like, I'm like, bile. yeah, exactly. I got no bile production at this time. So I have a massive blockage. So I go home that night and I have a fever now. My fever hits like 105. Oh man. And I feel terrible. But at about like six o'clock that night, my fever breaks. And I was like, oh, well, maybe I just had a virus or something. Now I felt totally fine. I felt totally normal. But I haven't eaten or drank water for two days at this point because I've been so nauseated. I wake up at four o'clock in the morning um, and it feels like a truck fell on me. I don't know what happened, but like literally all of my organs froze, which I now know it's because when the, when the appendix ruptured and, and, and spewed bacteria all over the body, like all the organs freeze and they paralyze. And so that's what had happened. And it, I couldn't walk. I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was suffocating slowly and my breath got shallower and shallower. And I thought I was, I just thought I was going to die. I didn't know what was going on. So my wife who's very little and can't do anything. Um, I crawl out of my house. It's winter. So it's snowy. So I crawl in our driveway. I'm like in my boxers. I'm like crawling in the snow to get in the car. She takes me to the room. They take me in and the doctor comes out. They, do the, they give me morphine, um, go through the whole bit. He gives me my, my CT scan. He's like, yep, your appendix ruptured. It's exploded all over your abdomen. You have a massive bacterial infection. I like, took my labs. My neutrophils were like 90% of my white count. I had no lymphocytes. I was like, Oh Lord. And he goes, Oh, by the way, there's also a mass on your kidney. You should get that checked out. And I was like, what? And so my wife, you know, I'm all drugged up. So I'm like, okay, whatever. And my wife's like, wait, what? And so as I'm laying in the hospital, uh, where I'm at, they will send you your reports. A, an automated thing kicks out an email and allows you to look at all your, your labs, your CT scans, your x-rays. So I'm sitting here laying in the hospital because I'm here for like three days. And I get my CT scan and it says, uh, uh, you know, potential neoplastic activity on the right mm-hmm. lower lobe of the kidney. And I was like, wait, what's neoplasm? And I look it up. I'm like, oh, they think I have cancer. So the doctor comes back and, and he's like, yeah, you know, we think it's like stage one or stage two, renal cell carcinoma. Um, so you need to go get your urologist tomorrow and check that out. I'm like, what's a carcinoma? And he's like, well, it's cancer. And I was like, what? Yeah. And so as I'm laying in the hospital bed, when they're told you think you have cancer, um, a lot of things go through your head. Like, am I going to be here next year? Like, so there's a lot of, you know, like, do I need to sell my business? Like, we just put up Christmas lights. Like, and I didn't even think I was going to be there to take them down. And so I just, you know, just everything in my life all of a sudden changed. And I did for a week, I probably didn't really sleep for several months. And all I did was research. I cut my business back. I traveled the U.S. I found every survivor of, of kidney cancer I could find. Um, in some cases, it's very aggressive. In some cases, it's not. Um, I talked to some doctors at the Cleveland clinic. I just tons of research. I never had it removed. I didn't do a biopsy. So I cannot say it was officially cancer or not. Cause that's the only way you can do it is once you actually have a biopsy. But the doctor's like, yeah, that's 90% because it's solid. If it was fluid filled, it'd be a cyst. When it's solid, it's a tumor. So we definitely think it's cancer. Well, it's been four years now and I get a scan every six months in terms of ultrasound. And it's, you know, praise God, it's smaller. It's still there, but it's smaller. But that's what led me into becoming more plant-based. So once I actually read all the research on it and felt comfortable with it and put together a curriculum for myself, you know, with lower, uh, obviously essential amino acids. So then I'm lowering mTOR. That's when I got into fasting and the circadian rhythms. So I can further lower mTOR. I take berberine and some other mTOR suppressing things just to keep that in check. I lowered my protein intake. So I really pushed a lot of different things to, to try and wrap my brain around it. Uh, That's crazy. That's a crazy story. And, 
uh, pretty remarkable. So, you know, good for you for doing your diligence and, and likely what, you know, what a lot of people don't do. And it's not saying it's right or wrong. It's just, sure. you know, for taking complete control into your own hands and doing what you thought was the best move and, um, and, and for addressing it from a nutrition and lifestyle standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so with that, so you research from doing the research, you realize that it might be make most sense to go on a plant-based diet. And you said, right. because of mTOR, what do you mean for those of, uh, uh you know, those listening that may not understand what mTOR is, why would it be important uh, if we are facing a cancer diagnosis? I don't want to, like, look, we're not doctors, whatever. I don't want to go down sure. that road. But exactly. simply from the aspect of, of mTOR, from a gross stimulus standpoint, why is that important and how does a plant-based diet affect that? Sure. So when I started looking across the board, I, I, I think, we back up one second, when I started looking across the board at the things that could potentially increase the cancer diagnosis and 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 its proliferation. Essential amino acids drive mTOR, which is a growth pathway, the mammalian target rapamycin, which is a growth pathway, which in, which is also somewhat related to IGF-1. As they both go up, growth goes up. Yes, it can help with muscular development, but it also makes things growing you don't want growing. Right. mTOR also increases the aging process. So people who generally have higher IGF-1 and higher mTOR levels actually age faster. Um, also they grow things faster. So when you're younger, do you want elevated mTOR and IGF-1? You also essentially, maybe a little bit want to, maybe some of the research is saying maybe after 65 as well, because IGF-1 really tanks when you, when you're older. Um, but in the middle years, you don't really want it elevated because that's when you can actually start to grow things. When I start looking back at like all the essential amino acids I'm taking in from all the meat I was eating Mm -hmm. and the branch chain amino acid supplements I was taking and all the protein powders, I'm like, I have literally been elevating mTOR my entire life at very, very, very high amounts. And I was eating from the time I woke up, literally to the time I went to bed. And I was using a lot of dairy. So when we start looking into casein, and we can start looking into some of the casein issues that could potentially increase cancer and some of those derivatives and the reverse, reverse bovine growth hormone that's in dairy. Then I started looking at NU5GC, which could potentially increase it. So then I started seeing like, wow, across the board, there's really a lot of things I've been eating for a long time that could potentially really stimulate this. Um, and then when you look at at least some of the ketogenic studies, and these are on rats, I get it. And they also fed them like vegetable oils, but they did put them on a ketogenic diet and the mTOR went up so high, especially in kidney cancer, it increased their growth hundred percent. Very dramatic. Hmm. I was like, Ooh. And, and if you have a gene abnormality, now I can't remember which the gene is, but if you have that and you're on a ketogenic diet, it's like hundred percent for hairy leukemia, 10% for melanoma, 10% for for prostate, 10% for breast. And it's like, it's a very high percentage of kidney, like 80 or 90%. A ketogenic diet, if you have this gene abnormality, and I can't remember what it is now, would actually be worse than just taking straight like table sugar for cancer. Like it will use ketones dramatically to grow very, very quickly. So when I start looking at all these things across the board, I'm like, and because I'd almost lost my gallbladder. So at the time I obviously could eat a lot of fat. So I couldn't even do low carb if I wanted to. I was like, hmm, so I'm kind of stuck with this high carb, low fat plant thing because it's the only way I can eat. From the research I've done and physically with all the digestive issues I'd had, this is the only thing that works for me. So then I started looking at fasting windows, which when you're not eating and calories aren't coming in, mTOR will drop, right? right? And so then I can slow the growth pathway of some of this. And then when you're starting to look at higher carb diets and lower protein diets specifically, it elevates CMPK which is another regulator of mTOR, which can keep fat suppressed. And like I mentioned, berberine, which berberine will suppress mTOR. Then I also started taking glycine because methionine is also another sulfur-containing amino acid that can increase cancer growth. So I started taking glycine, which helps you dump methionine. So I really started hitting it from, and I also take a product called um, Metronol, which is also sometimes called Ab Ultra, And it actually balances TH1 and TH2, so you don't have an immune system's dominance or loophole. And it also slows glucose regulation by abnormal cells. Is that so a, a, a prescription drug? Nope. It's actually what it is. It's a supplement. It's actually fermented wheat germ. And you can get it from a company called American Bioscience. And the research on it's pretty staggering. So I take that in combination with like an absolute ton of medicinal mushrooms to yep. elevate my white count, keep my immune system elevated. I manage my stress. I work out. I prioritize sleep. I really am very careful about my lighting environment. 
And at night when the sun goes down, I turn on my red few lights and I turn off all the overhead um, fluorescence and LEDs, uh, not fluorescence, but the LEDs. Um, and I wear like the red lenses if I'm watching TV or whatever. I'm just very careful about my exposure. And then I, I increase my faith and I put God first, my family first, and then I put work a distant third instead of it used to be the exact opposite. Totally. So I basically just did the exact opposite of what I was doing before. <laughs> That's you know, awesome. So rather I'm an N one, right? So experiment of one. So rather it's working or not, it's clearly not spreading. It's not going anywhere as of right now. Everything's fine. I also take modified citrus pectin because of yeah. the research I've seen with that in terms of anti metastatic. Um, the one animal product that I do take is I do take colostrum just because of the IgG boost. And I've seen some very good research on it being anti metastatic. It also helps your body not absorb iron and keep your ferritin levels low because cancer can use iron. Um, so that's the other benefit of plant-based diet. You're actually not getting um, heme iron. You're getting non-heme iron. So right. when I kind of started hitting these, and I also noticed once I went plant-based because I was also dropping my saturated fat intake, my blood sugar levels naturally plummeted. Like sometimes they're like 75, even on a very high-carb diet. My fasting glucose will, will always be under 84, always. So it was, it was, one, it was just, it was almost like that was what I was designed to do. And I do great on it. And my protein is a lot lower. I generally keep my protein usually off like Eric Helms recommendation about the 0.7 grams per pound of body weight. That's kind of where I keep mine. Um, I don't go much higher than that. And I keep, well, that's, that's, I mean, that's a good chunk of protein for, sure. you don't need to go higher than that. I mean, especially considering you're plant-based. So when you say, let's, yeah. let's be clear. When you say plant-based, are you vegan or? Yeah. Okay. Well, I would say the one animal product I use, because I will occasionally cook with ghee. Okay. okay. Cause I do like ghee and I just like the way it tastes. Um, and I use colostrum. Those are the two things I use that are animal based. I use two tablespoons of colostrum a day and one teaspoon of ghee a day. That's it. I, when the fish oil I take is actually an algae based fish oil because I'm trying to, uh, avoid the POC, the, uh, the POCPs that also have been shown to potentially increase kidney cancer. So that's where, that's where my stuff falls. So I think sometimes when people say plant-based, all that really means is it doesn't necessarily mean you're vegan. It just means the majority of your diet is plants. Right. You could still be paleo, but be plant-based. Sure. It doesn't mean you're vegan. Um, and there's occasionally, sometimes I'll eat salmon or fish. I just, but what I really noticed is once I pulled that out of my diet, I don't ever miss it. Where before I thought I have to have this. I really, once I stopped eating meat, I actually realized I don't think I ever really liked it. I just ate it because I thought I needed it. Mm -hmm. And but now, but my diet is so much more colorful and more enjoyable and, and the food's more appetizing. I can't count the amount of times I would make just like chicken and broccoli and take it to work. And I'm not eating that. And I would just go eat someplace else, you know? So, but I never not eat my food now. So yeah, with the plant-based diet, I usually get between 150 to 170 grams of protein a day. That's kind of the cap I keep on it. And my eating window, um, which you and I had kind of talked about, I also instinctively felt skipping breakfast was a bad idea. Because what I started noticing was very hypo metabolic symptoms, like very cold. My hand, I mean, my fingernails would turn blue. I would get so cold if I don't eat. Um, I would get really tired. And I would start noticing like, you know, essentially from some catecholamine overstimulation. Yes. Sometimes I would get like, why am I so amped up when I'm not eating? This is insane. Like some people are like, I feel amazing when I don't eat. I'm like, it's because you're running off adrenaline. That's why. Totally. It's just completely overloading a whole nother element of, yeah. of uh, sympathetic nervous system stimulation. Yeah. And, and so what we were talking about, well, first of all, I think uh, kudos to you, I mean, for making that transition. I think that's, that's awesome. I think it's daunting the amount of work that goes into successfully implementing a plant-based diet. Like you can, and, and I've had other, I've had other vegans on the show before and you can, you can have a plant-based diet and get, enough protein to still support lean muscle tissue. I think there's this massive disconnect between like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the conventional wisdom is like, if we're on a plant-based diet, then we're not eating any protein, but it's simply not the case. Like you can absolutely get enough protein. Obviously it's not animal protein, but mm -hmm. with that said, but it's a lot of work. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a lot of work. I think, I, I mean, I think, I think now, Ben, I think it's actually easy. I think at the time it was a lot of work because I didn't know how I was doing. Yeah. And I was like, so what do I do? I just eat fruits and vegetables. Like, what do I eat? <laughs> right. So I think that that's I think that that's the hurdle a lot of people face yeah. is when they go plant based, they just don't know what to eat. And I'm like, no, no, no. So once you actually start teaching people how to eat the structure, it's actually pretty easy, and I can track my macros on it, and it's very simple. It just it does it just it's just relearning things, you know. And and so then it was also breaking like fear, like 
I was always taught to fear tofu and soy. You know how much freaking soy I eat a day? And my testosterone is about 750. And my free testosterone right now is about 80 or 90. I mean, my free testosterone when I was a meat eater was never, ever above 10, ever. Even with very So you're getting a significant portion of your daily protein intake from soy based. I would say, uh, I would say, so what I usually do is I, you know, so tofu comes in a package, right? So I typically have half a package of breakfast and I have a half a package at lunch. And then the rest of my protein sources come from beans, um, plant-based protein powders. And I still use Polycom's Primal Cure because it's just my favorite protein ever. Yeah, it's a good taste of it. Good product. Um, That's, um, yep. It's Imogen. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So same thing. Yeah. So, um, so I just use that as my predominant protein source. And, and because my fat is also relatively low, um, you know, you're getting protein from everything. And I think the other misconception is that, well, plants don't have all the amino acids. They actually do. They just have a different concentration. They're actually amino, they're diluted in some of the amino acids, which is actually beneficial for what I'm trying to do. Because I don't want some of those like isoleucine valine, especially valine. I don't want them that high because I understand it increases protein synthesis, but that also increases mTOR, which is not what I'm trying and to do. And you said you want low methionine as well, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So when I track my intake and I will sometimes, I, the other day I was actually, well, let me punch what I used to eat. I mean, my methionine now never breaks probably 1.5, 1.7 grams a day. Plus, I'm taking glycine throughout the day each meal, not only as a blood sugar stabilizer, but to dump the excess methionine. Um, I mean, my, my, when I was looking at my, how I used to eat, my methionine would hit like five to six grams a day. I mean, it was mm-hmm. crazy high. So once I really started looking at all these things, I was like, wow, this really isn't that hard. And it's pretty easy to manipulate. I, I say it's easy because I spent years researching it. I get it. It's hard when you first start, but as long as you have a guide on it, you know, shifting plant-based is easy. And what I actually noticed too is it's, you know, it, I was a very elite level strength athlete for a long time. I know I'm 40. I still train very hard. And I still do natural bodybuilding shows. But what I've actually noticed is I, I've always been genetically blessed to recover very, very well. Like I could work out and then it feels like I haven't worked out and I could work out again. And so I could improve really quickly. But what I actually noticed is on plant-based that got even better. And once I started noticing, I was like, wow, like, and it's probably just because the diet is so high in antioxidants and just some polyphenols I was missing that I can recover even faster now and I can train harder and I just rarely get sore. Even if I train super hard, it just doesn't happen like it used to. And I don't have joint pain. I also have gout issues. So anytime I actually try and go back to eating meat within a day or two, my joints start feeling like somebody hit me with a hammer. And so that's the other reason why I stay plant-based because several of my brothers have gout, like massive, mad, like like amputation almost type of gout. Wow. So that's definitely not a road I want to get to. Um, I mean, it literally looks like they have softballs in their skin. So um, that is actually how I manage mine. I have zero issues with it. And so for, it just, for me, it was like, look, dude, just, it's a sign of the universe, man. Like I'm not saying it may work well for everyone, but it works well for me. And then that's not only do I keep my growth in check, but my uric acid doesn't bother me. My blood sugar is perfect. Like, all my other markers are perfect. I have good energy. I sleep better. I'm a much calmer person, um, probably because my diet's a lot higher in potassium magnesium, keeping me more mellow than it was. I used to always have a terrible temper when I ate a lot of meat, and I don't know what the correlation is. I've heard a lot of anecdotal reasons why, but just for me, um, the less of it I eat, just I just stay very calm. Yeah. And, I, and so that was helped managing my stress and that type of stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's fascinating. Absolutely. I think it, you know, it's also just like a really good, it, it's a really good avenue and perspective into how there's no one right way, right? It was, we can all do things that, that there's, especially with these genetic factors is understanding like, yeah, for, for sure. For some people, keto may really legitimately work well for other people. It's the worst possible thing you could do and so i think people need to really learn how to listen to their body and and be a little more intuitive as opposed to just looking at what other people are doing although i think experimentation is good as long as you're being intuitive with it hey guys i just wanted to interrupt this interview really quickly to let you know about a great resource that i created for you Now, you've been hearing me speak a lot about the benefits of intermittent fasting, but more specifically about the five-day fasting mimicking diet. And since I've been getting so many questions about it, I'm happy to let you know that I created a 
free five-day fasting mimicking diet guide and detox plan to share with you on the exact strategies that I use both for myself and my clients, including how to implement a five-day fasting plan, which includes exactly what to eat and when to eat it, the inflammatory foods that you must avoid during the plan to quickly improve your digestion, why fasting is the fastest way to improve energy and initiate weight loss, which three specific nutrients to use to support optimal detoxification, as well as five proven strategies to help you manage hunger during your fast. So if this sounds like something you'd be interested in, just check out the show notes to link to this five-day FMD guide. And if you're in front of your computer, you can download that immediately by going to go dot bslnutrition.com forward slash fmd so with that said as we were talking about intermittent fasting we're talking about time restricted feeding and and so you were making the observations and this is the same thing that i started to observe and finally found some i think there's more research coming out now suggesting Mm -hmm. what we're all kind of familiar with the route of intermittent fasting is kind of stop eating at, you know, seven or 8 PM. Don't eat again until whatever you skip breakfast and however many meals till your a certain eating window for a lot of people, they do the 16, eight. So Mm -hmm. you stop eating at 8 PM. You don't eat again until noon. But what I was suggesting and I, and you agree with me, I believe is that that's kind of inverted to what we probably should doing and what actually makes sense based on our circadian rhythms, our ancestors, and, and the way kind of our physiology works. Let's talk about mm-hmm. that a little bit. Yeah, you know, it's funny because it's just funny. Going through this thing is just, I would never, ever, ever, ever. And, I, and what I tell people too is if I died tomorrow, I'd be totally fine with it now. But when, I, when they told me I had cancer, all these things happened. I was like, shit, man, like I can't die now. I feel so unfulfilled. I haven't done as much. But now I'm to the point now where I'm like, I feel good. And I'm not going anywhere and everything's great. But you just start to learn like, damn, I wish intuitively I had listened to that about mm-hmm. my body a long time ago. And so I had tried intermittent fasting off and on and high fat diets off and on. I never felt good doing any of it, but I just did it because I thought like it was the magic bullet for fat loss. When in the end, there isn't one. But what I noticed was every time I would skip breakfast, I feel like shit and I would be tired and I'd be shaky and I'd be cold. And I was like, and then when I'd eat, I'm like, oh, I feel better now. But man, it was just like a struggle for me to skip breakfast and eat lunch. And I was like, you know, I don't really like eating that late because I don't like eating that close before bed because I just don't sleep as well. Right. And so I was like, well, what if I just, I could still keep that window, but what if I just ate breakfast and I skipped dinner? So I started doing that and I felt it was like night and day difference. I was like, Oh, cause I'm a morning person. So I get up at four. So yep. for me to get up at four and I eat till noon, I'm like, Oh my God, all I'm doing is thinking about food all day. So, and then that shifted more my, my, my dependency back on caffeine, which I did not want to be on. So, I just started shifting at breakfast. So my actual eating window is usually eight to five or nine to six. I'm not too rigid on it. I, I never go longer than 12. And what I really found through my research with Sachin Panda and Dr. Roger Patrick and some yeah. other people, it's like, it's just daylight, man. Yeah. Just eat when it's daylight. That's, That's the easiest right. thing to do. Yeah. Like you don't have to get it caught up on all these fucking windows. It's so confusing. It drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> when it's daylight, not that complicated. So then I just started switching to like, yeah, I'll eat around eight or nine. And I usually wrap up by five or six and I eat three to four meals a day. Very That's, simple. It. That's it. And it, it works great for me. It does work great and works great for most people. It's dude, just think about the average client that you're seeing. And let's just think about the average American. And if you stopped eating when the sun goes down or stopped eating at 6 PM, how many calories you're going to save between 6 PM and 10 or 11 or 12 AM. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's and- different. Yeah. And, and with that too, to your point, you're also cutting out a lot of binge eating and drinking yeah. and, and snacking. So what I tell clients, I'm like, it's not that you can't do any of that. Just stop your window right here. And what you'll find, and even Sachin Panda talks about this too, it's like, it's not even, and the thing that really impressed me about his research that I thought was amazing, he's like, when we look at people, even if they don't change their diet, but they only eat when it's daylight. He goes, you actually see all of their blood pathology normalize. So even if they don't lose weight, glucose normalizes, cholesterol normalizes, uh, CRP normalizes, like cytokines, like everything just starts to normalize. I'm like, like what an amazing find. That yes. if, even if you, even if one of those people are like, you know, I'm a sugar addict, I can't give up this, I can't give up. I'm like, that's cool, man. Just do it when it's daylight. 
You know, I'd be like, oh, it's, I don't have to give all this up. It, it's such a remarkable tool that's so seemingly simple, yet not easy because mm -hmm of the culture that we live in. And I understand fully, like, I mean, I have three kids, you know, both my, my wife and myself, we work all the time and coordinating schedules and sports and all this shit. And I get it. But if those of you listening, like if you're looking for a magic bullet, this is it. It's this mm -hmm. whole concept of time restricted feeding and simply at the very least stop eating for a 12 hour window. Ideally, when the sun goes down and don't eat again until the sun comes up, you typically, you know, a little bit earlier than when the sun goes down, depending on the time of year. But you know, let's say 6 p.m., 5, 6 p.m., mm -hmm. don't eat again until 6 a.m. And that mm -hmm. alone, my friends, is saving you so many calories from foods that are not foods typically. Mm -hmm. And you said it with, with regard to blood chemistry and, and, and labs improving is – we as humans are not meant to eat consistently over long periods of time, like in a given day or whatever. It's like we evolved through periods of feast and famine. And now what's cool about a lot of the intermittent, a lot of the, I'll say fasting research that's coming out. I won't say anything to in terms of longevity because we don't know in terms of longevity, but what we do know is in terms of more short term improvements in cholesterol and improvements of in improvements in insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome and uh, autophagy in terms of cellular cleanup and repair and protection is there's uh, you know potentially cancer prevent prevention is there's so much cool stuff that we're starting to attribute to these periods of, of, of prolonged fasting mm -hmm. that so much so that that's, you know, part of why people should be implementing it in my opinion, as a, in addition to also, it's just a great way to not eat as much, you know, period. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think the thing that how I stumbled onto it, cause again, after my cancer diagnosis, I was always looking for, I say potential, because I don't ever, I don't own that diagnosis. And when I talk about it, I always call it my kidney pimple because I refuse to give it power. So there's just a mindset work there. But when I was, when I found my kidney pimple, I was always looking for a magic bullet. How am I going to get rid of this thing? You know, how am I going to get rid of this thing? And I eventually became at peace with it after I read several resources on it. I was like, okay, whatever. It's there, whatever, whatever. It is what it is. But I, that's when I came across um, the breast cancer study when they looked at women I can't remember the doctor. There's a female doctor you probably know, but they looked at time restricted feeding. And what they said was when these are women who had breast cancer and if they kept them between a 6 a.m. and a 6 p.m. eating cycle, it reduced their chance of recurrence by 40%. And that's even if they didn't change their diet. And I was like, whoa, what? And then if they lost 5% of their body weight, you could reduce the risk by 40%. And I was like, so I was just stacking like all these things like, okay, well, if I can stack all these things in my favor, like meditation, right? So I can calm my nervous system. I can get more parasympathetic dominance. So I can start to rest and recover and just like, and so then I started doing these things. I'm like, basically all I need to do is, is probably live my life how I should have been living it. Right. Yeah. Don't burn the candle at both ends. You know, just love people, treat other people well, don't hold grudges. Like, you know, like don't drive yourself from the ground. Don't put money first. Like just all these things that I think our culture really drives you into believing are important, which I can tell you when you think they're, when you lay there and you're thinking you're dying, I will promise you none of that shit will ever matter to you. The first thing I thought of was like, I felt embarrassed because I was like, I have for years, and I was making so emotional, put my wife uh, last. And yeah. I was one time I actually told her, work comes first. And I'm embarrassed that I ever did that. And I think that when you're, when you're laying there and this doctor's like, oh yeah, and they're talking about it like you're not even in the fucking room, which if I could strangle this doctor, I would. It's like, oh yeah, it's right here. Yeah, that'll probably evade events to your, your wall and it'll probably spread because you know, kidneys highly vascular. And so it'll get in the lymphatic system. And you know, most people don't live it like here. I'm like, it's crazy. Like, you know, thanks for the support guy. You know, with my wife in the room and then and then I'm looking at her and then she's crying and I'm thinking like, holy shit. Like I have never put her first and here I am. This guy's telling me I probably got a year to live and like what what have I done? And so that's when I was just like, I'm gonna get out of this and I'm going to change. And so the next day I went vegan and I put my wife first and I kept my work schedule back and I put God first. 
And I just, I just said, screw it. If I die in two months, I'm going to live my life. How I want to live it. And that was the best gift I could have ever had. And that's what I said. I would never, ever, ever take it back, no matter what happens. But that's what really spawned my research and all this other stuff that people would always tell me, oh, you should probably make this change. You should probably do this. And, and you'd hear these stories of people who have diseases or they die or whatever happens. Like, oh, you know, these other things don't matter. And it was always, I'd hear that and it would just be like one ear out the other, whatever. Never happened to me. I don't care. That's an excuse, whatever. But when it happens to you, like, wow, it's really true. And so then I started to notice it and I was like, when I really started researching these things, like I said, I found this stuff on fasting. I'm like, oh, so autophagy and so phagocytosis and then just reducing fuel sources of all fuel sources. Because people are like, well, sugar grows cancer. I'm like, every source in your body, every, every cell can use any fuel source, okay? It, it doesn't matter. Like if cancer is very adaptive and if you look at some of the other studies, it can do really well on high fat diets and kill you. It can do really well on high protein diets. So I'm like, well, again, it just has to be what resonates to you and what you feel good on. But that's how I stumbled on the fasting research. And then I started seeing Walter Longo stuff. And yeah. I've done several rounds of the time, you know, his fasting mimicking diet. I've even made my own. And I was like, you know, that's, but then I started noticing too, like the more I did Walter Longo stuff, the more I noticed that catecholamine response. That's it. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I actually want to talk about this for a minute because I'm super interested in the fasting mimicking. I kind of have my own version, although I feel mm-hmm. I feel weird saying like I have my own version. Like this dude, mm-hmm. he's a, just a brilliant, you know, oh, yeah. ecologist, researcher. Like I, I don't even want to claim for one second to have something comparable, but it's it's just comparable to the degree of like it's five days and I tried to match macros up to be mm-hmm. – you know, more plant-based, obviously there's no animal protein, but with that, I don't want to get into the details right now. Um, but with that is, um, so, so what, what's your experience with been with the five day fasting mimicking? Like, how did you feel with that? Were you doing it just kind of to, to test it out or? Mm-hmm. I was primarily doing it cause just as another way to I, and I think it's easy to get in these rabbit holes, you know, and I was talking to survivors. Like I actually met the longest living survivor of stage four kidney cancer. He's still alive. He's a help just protect his name, but he's a pastor in California, runs a mega church, like a $50 million church in Southern California. And I heard him on a podcast and I contact this guy every Monday for seven months and he never called me. And finally one day he called me back and I just told him every day. I'm like, I'm going to keep calling you till you call me back. And so he finally called me back one day and we talked and he was like, you know, part of what I did, he told me about his diet and he told about his faith and his prayers and infrared sauna and fasting. So I was just looking all these things I could gravitate to. And I was like, Oh, well, like anything, Oh, for little fasting is good. A lot of fasting should be better. And I mean, dude, I was fasting at some points, like five day water fast. And I did mm-hmm. that. Like, hey, I got done like 150 pounds. I'm like, this doesn't feel right. Like yeah. I was just rapidly depleting my body. So when I went to Walter Longo stuff, I'm like, Oh, okay. So, for five days and I get to eat a little bit of food, I can actually drop IGF-1. I can drop mTOR. I can drop right. all these things. I can reduce inflammation. I'm like, okay. And and, autophagy. Exactly. Or autophagy, yeah. Yep. And so when he's talking about doing that, I'm like, okay, let's try that. So I, I've done five cycles of it. And then like you, I just started making my own and matched the macros. Yeah, so fine. that's what I was going to ask. So so you did the the actual Prolon patented yep. Yep. bars and, I, and soups yep. and stuff. Yep. I've done four, I've done four rounds on his actual product on Prolon. Um, and it, uh, and it was okay. I mean, I, I, I noticed like just eating actual whole foods, but matching the macros, I could easily do it. And I noticed the more cycles you do of it, it gets very easy. And a lot of the sure. catecholine stuff goes away and your hunger goes away. But I noticed the first couple of times I did it. I mean, I struggled like the very first time I did it. I barely made it that far. Actually, the first time I did, it, I ate on Friday night. I did it on Monday and I went four and a half days. I was like, I just can't do it. Yeah. And the second round, it was easy. And the third round is even easier. Yeah. Yeah. I, same. I, I've done it twice, both my own ways. I haven't done the patented way, but first time, not, yeah, I mean, not easy. Second time, a little bit easier. Although I really noticed, um, I noticed on the second round that I really think cortisol was a big issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and now thinking back on it, like initially I'd felt like I had a lot more energy. I felt like I didn't need to sleep as much, but I think that was an mm-hmm. adrenaline, an adrenaline exactly. response and yeah, talk exactly. about the catecholamines. And, and I, so that's why I'm really wanting to play around with it. But I'm, I also think that it's going to depend on the size of the person mm-hmm. that you are. It doesn't make sense. Like if I'm 220 pounds, 
why am I doing 800 and 1200 cal to, you know, to 1100 calories when 110 pound females doing the exact same? It doesn't make mm-hmm. sense. Exactly. And that's what could be roughly her maintenance calories. But yeah. for you, it's like a 70% deficit. Yeah. And it's yeah. just, it's just, it's terrible. So I think that obviously, you know, you have to have, he has to have it controlled for, for his research purposes. But I, that's where I see and the way I play around with it in terms of, you know, using things like the, uh, the, the primal clear, like, you know, using the plant-based protein shakes and, mm-hmm. and, and focusing on different areas of detoxification system support and kind of leveraging, you know, a couple different things in the process mm-hmm. because ultimately what's so beneficial in my opinion for most people is, is just the experience of going without food, reduced mm-hmm. calories, kind of mm-hmm. everything that goes with it. You're giving someone a set time frame to, to just kind of experience that. I think it's tremendously valuable from a hunger standpoint. Absolutely. I think it teaches people that hunger isn't an emergency and that you're not going to die if you don't eat. And I think one of the things that it, it, it taught me is I would actually do it on my deloading weeks from training. And yes. So I was like, oh, I'm really curious to see how I would come back the following week. I felt great. I didn't lose any strength at all. I felt amazing. I had no problems picking right back up where I left off. And I noticed de- definitely some decreased choice inflammation. Um, obviously, your waist shrinks like crazy. Um, cravings change. But I, I think with clients that put it on in, in, in at least a modified version of it, it teaches them that, yeah, like this is when you're actually hungry. Now you get to experience what true hunger feels like. Not mm-hmm. I'm bored. I'm going to go eat or, right. you know, Hey, do you want to go to lunch? Yeah. It's about that time. Let's go eat. You're not even hungry because like you said earlier, it's, it, they're, we're getting more wrapped up in our culture and really other things versus actually intuitive eating and listening to our body. And I think that the fast and moving diet is a nice job of resetting that and helping you understand when you're actually hungry. Yeah. It seems like, so I, I value most is the reduced inflammation for sure. Gut health improvement um, so potential, maybe there's potential food sensitivity stuff going on there. And then I think, yeah, like you said, with utilizing it with a deload week, um, I, you know, I'd like to do it again, but I've been training consistently and feeling good. I, I can't, you can't obviously can't train with it. Right. So, um, I will do it again when I do end up doing a deload, which maybe in the next couple of weeks. Um, but also leveraging the significant reduction in calories to then go into, um, basically a surplus phase of mm-hmm. saying, I'm mm-hmm. going to train my ass off and I'm going to mm-hmm. eat like a pig mm-hmm. too mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and take advantage of, of that anabolic window, if you will. Cool. So that's, I think there's just so much fascinating stuff, but especially with Dr. Walter Longo's research is what he's showing is that if you do this, he used a clinical group of humans and he did it for five days, three months in a row. And then he retested blood work after maybe six or nine months and showed that there was continued uh, basically depression and inflammation and Mm -hmm. cholesterol and blood lipids and um, organ improvement in terms of the Mm -hmm. size of the organs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So very cool research. I mean, Mm -hmm. very cool research. I was very interested too, because coming off keto, keto had actually developed a little bit of fatty liver. So I was really interested in the fasting applications, especially when he mentioned organ shrinkage. I was like, well, that's appealing. Um, so yeah, I think that, uh, I think that it's a great, and kind of what I was doing, especially when he was saying like, you know, if you're doing it one month or one week, a month, every, every month for 90 days, that was my initial cycle I did originally. And then I also liked his research, especially for neurological conditions like MS. And he was saying, yes. you know, what we had found is one cycle, one five days cycle is, equi- is better than six months on a ketogenic diet. And I was like, whoa. It's so, so it just sheds light to how remarkable the, the human body works and takes us back to what I was suggesting. It's like, how did we develop as humans, right? Through periods of feast and famine, there's no question about it. And therefore, there's, there's certain responses that our body goes through during these periods to enable us to function optimally um, during these periods of, of stress without food. And, and so it, it is pretty, pretty incredible. I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, what type of results uh, mm-hmm. he's 
it, you know, the research shows in the, in the upcoming years and how we can start to leverage it into improving people's health. But I agree in terms of like, well, five days, once a month, maybe if you're aggressively someone dealing with metabolic syndrome or, you know, uh, uh, gross obesity or something like that. Absolutely. But otherwise a few times a year, and I think it sh should be a great tool for people to implement mm -hmm. with their diet. So I just, I want to, I want to wrap things up here, Matt. Uh, but mm -hmm. what I'd like to just touch on is we talked about obviously the benefits of plant-based for you. And in general, we talked about it, some of the elements of, uh, fasting and how it can be beneficial for people to say nothing of whether they're, you know, plant-based or otherwise, um, what are a couple other methodologies or strategies or tools that you implement that are not rooted in training, nutrition, or um, supplementation, if you will, I, I say, you know, you mentioned the blue light, but that you're utilizing to help you stay strong and vibrant? I think uh, I really got into meditation and I hired a meditation teacher for a long time. And that really helped me a lot. And now I just use Headspace and I do it every day. Yeah. Um, and I really got to the point where I think the biggest things for me was essentially eating with daylight and moving my, my stuff up, moving a plant-based diet, managing my stress. And then that's where I noticed. And even using like CBD products and different things, mm -hmm. like I actually have a patch right now on my ankle. Um, and just, just the big thing that I came away with was just managing my stress is really yeah. what I did. And then just giving back. And looking for people that I could help when I had an opportunity, right? Instead of being so selfish, because I was always a very selfish person. I still am a little bit. I think you have to be a little bit. But, um, <laughs> but looking at how I can help other people. Um, but I think meditation, honestly, was because I was looking up one of the prostate cancer studies. And they, and they were looking at oncogenes and epigenetics and flipping on and off genes. And they were saying, you know, six weeks of teaching guys meditation, just 20 minutes a day. And then at the end of six weeks, when they reevaluate a lot of the oncological genes and epigenetic markers, they found that these guys had turned off over a thousand different oncological promoting genes and turned off some of these epigenetic switches that were essentially causing their cancer to grow. And all these guys in this particular study um, had no progression. They either were maintenance or had regressions. So that's pretty powerful. So I was really, I'd say a great book if anyone's dealing with cancer or a family member, there's a great book by Dr. Kelly Turner called Radical Remissions. And she essentially surveyed like a thousand people who went into spontaneous remissions where all evidence of disease was disappeared. And she put together, she was a statistician. She said, there's 86 things that people did, but there's only nine things that every single person did. And so her book is about the nine things that everyone did. And the first one is diet, which is more plant-based, if not vegan. The second one was supplementation and things to boost immune system and manage stress and, and to fill nutrient deficiencies and excess vitamin D and that type of thing. But the other seven things were all about mental and spiritual outlook. So having fun, giving back, connecting with others, meditating, like, you know, um, just, just watching things that are funny, you know, like just, just really focusing on slowing down your life and having fun. And I was like, wow. And she's like, and her whole point in the book was like, if you notice this, like almost 80% of what people are doing has nothing to do with diet, has nothing to do with supplementation. It's actually a lifestyle change. And she had several chapters in there about meditation. And that's when I was like, all right, I'm gonna, I should, I've always wanted to meditate. I need to pick this up. So yeah. I really started doing it. And, and I can tell a, a tremendous difference when I do it and if I get away from it. So I actually make it a, a point to do it every day. Even if it's only for a minute or two at night, I will make a point to do it every day and I never miss a day. Um, and then on days where I have more time, I try and do it for 20 minutes. And I've really found that that's like that. And I think the time restricted feeding have, like, you know, my labs are always great and they're still great. Um, but I just noticed just a sense of well-being improvement and just more calm and more relaxed and more level-headed that, and, on, and on what I think else is funny is using, uh, cause I had so many gut infections and other stuff post-surgery and I clearly had a lot of gut issues going into it was taking like very high dose, uh, oregano oil mm. was like a game changer for me. Like my stomach pain cleared up, my gas and bloating, cleared, like everything went away. And so just probably those three things were really like game changers for me was just meditation you know uh the eating window and then oregano oil and like what do you think the oregano that, oil was just as an antifungal kind of yeah i think that i've always had very high fungal loads like always and um just from histories of antibiotics and very high doses of nsaids for a very long time when i competed yeah and okay. i think i just destroyed my stomach 
So yeah, and then being on IV antibiotics for three days after my appendix ruptured, that was super good. After that, I couldn't digest an apple. It was terrible. So how have you, this is going to be my last question, then I want you to kind of share with everyone how they can find out, find more about you. But how have you taken all of this and translated it into your coaching practice, you know, into your physical gym, into your online coaching, mm-hmm. obviously coming, having, having so many systems in place that my different nutritional philosophy than what you have now, how have you implemented that? So that's a good question. So it, obviously it's one that's made me more compassionate and it's made me realize that there aren't magic bullets. I start with moderation on people. If they want to be plant-based, great. I'll teach them to be plant-based. If they don't, it's fine. However they're eating, I just try to make it better and easier yeah. and a more sustainable approach. And then I do in, in implement the fasting windows because I think it's very important. And then um, outside of that, like I'll try and get them to manage their stress more, not over-exercise so much, not yeah. drive themselves to the ground, which I think a lot of people do, and focus a lot more on sleep you know, and light management. And just very simple things that a lot of things are free um, that clients, I think, are low-hanging fruit that they can really take advantage of. Yeah. Beautiful, man. So with that said, uh, how can people find out more about you? So they go to our website, which is uh, bodysolutionskc.com. Um, you can find me on, um, I'm not really on Instagram. I kind of hate it. Um, I kind of stick on Facebook mostly. Um, but they can find me at, uh, you know, I'm at Matt Terry on Facebook. Um, there's several, but you'll see me. I'm the one with Body Solutions. That's pretty much I can find it. Facebook posts are phenomenal, by the way. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, I, every time you post something, I'm like, God, damn, he just said that in such <laughs> a brilliant way. That's exactly like, resonates exactly with what I preach, but you just say it so eloquently. So keep up the good work there. But for those of you listening, make sure you check out the show notes below for Body Solutions website, as well as make sure you follow Matt on Facebook. And then you guys do online coaching as well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we work with people in person, we work with people online. Um, and in our online programs, we actually have two, and it's, it's actually what I'm really proud of is, so we do a 90 day program, which is where we're trying to kind of get, it's, we call it our 12 week transformation. We just try and get people's results right away. And it's usually more macro based. We're just trying to help them understand the basics. And then we shift them into our year long program, which is all about behavior change, teaching and behavior management techniques every day and mindset work, and then teaching intuitive eating. So we'll, we'll take them in through a little bit of calorie tracking and counting. We won't keep them there forever. We'll get them down to their goals. We'll kind of reverse that and back up. And then we'll teach them maintenance and um, the intuitive eating strategies, like eating 80% full, all the precision nutrition stuff, chewing slowly, you know, and just teaching them why what we're doing works and how to really take control, not just of their body, but of their mindset. And that's a year long program. So um, yeah, but that, that's what I'm most proud of is it's essentially our year long program is a complete behavior change program. Cool. Matt, dude, such a pleasure having the opportunity to chat with you again. Um, just thank you so much for sharing everything that you've been been through, knowledge, wisdom, passion. And uh, man, I'm sure our listeners are, are very grateful as well. So uh, with that said, man, I'll let you get on with the rest of your day. But thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Awesome, man. So happy to be here. And thanks for inviting me on. Take care. Bye. Thanks, buddy. Did you love this episode of the Smart Nutrition Made Simple show? Then head on over to iTunes, subscribe, and leave a positive rating and review. And more importantly, share this with other men that you know are dedicated to leveling up in every area of their life by learning how to live healthier, more energetic, and productive lives so that they can optimize their health for their family and future. Thank you for listening. And if you want to find out more about how you can work directly with Ben, then just head on over to www.bslnutrition.com forward slash level up.